Welcome back, everyone, to your friendly stock building gas powered bike page. All right, what we got going on today is that we have a friend that called from Florida. Yes, this bike is going from Illinois to Florida. It's a friend of mine from way back. He's a machinist. They build a late model and modified race car engines and race all over the place. And I'm pretty positive he could put his own gas powered bike together. But my other pretty positive is, is he's probably just doesn't want a fool that take time out. He just wants one to ride around his property and subdivision or whatever. I guess when they're not racing. Or just in general to go out and poke around. I don't know. But I got to get this one put together because he has someone that is going to take some engines to him from here to build, to drop off, I guess. And they're going to take this bike for him so he doesn't have to pay for the shipping. And uh, he'll get it that much quicker. So while I'm building this bike, I thought I would share a couple tidbits. I'm sure I have shared them in past videos. So I might be covering something twice. But that's okay, because this might be the first time you caught my bike page. And uh, maybe these little tips and tidbits will help you get your bike together and uh, have a little more quality build. Not saying that, you know, I'm the ultimate Jesus Christ of building bikes, but my bikes do do pretty well. All right, today we're going to talk about the stud removal, tightening up the studs of the engine mounts on these bikes. Because to be 100% honest, it is my opinion, slash 95% fact, all of these engine kits come from China. I don't care where you buy them from, what denomination, what bike shop, bike store, whatever, they all originate in China. And the quality isn't 100%, 90% of the time. So you have to help it along to get a little longevity out of your bike and your motor. So these are a few things I personally do to help that little tidbit along. First, when I pull the bike engine out of the box, I tighten every bolt. If it has the Phillips screws, doesn't matter. They've been using hex heads for a long time now. That is a bonus. A little less stripping out of the bolt heads. But I tighten every one because sometimes they are put together in a hastily fashion, obviously, from the Chinese factory, and they're not exactly tight. So if you don't do that, it can give you problems in the future. I'm sorry you have to listen to the train noise, but we got the shop door open today due to it being 90 degrees and 70% plus humidity. I got the fans going, so hopefully you can hear me over the fans. Usually I try to turn that stuff off. That way it's a nice, more clear video, but we're all going to suffer along today. Anyway, I have tightened all the other bolts, and then I got to checking the studs for the motor mounts, which I personally always do. Sometimes they're tight, sometimes they're not. They need to be more than just finger tight. You would think that tightening them up would put tension on the threads inside the block and kind of pull them tight even if they're finger tight and the uh, you know friction of them being pulled against each other would keep them tight and snug, but that is not always the case. So I suggest always check your studs right out of the box from the factory because a lot of times they're loose. Now I am going to show you, for those who don't know, a stud removal and installation tool. It's designed just for studs slides down on top of it just like that you put your ratchet in there go the direction that you're turning your stud as soon as I get the ratchet going the right way and it doesn't hurt the threads so you can tighten your studs and make sure they're 100% in same way with reverse the wheel just flips itself around when you turn the ratchet around as of such change your ratchet and now you can take the stud out after I knock the bottle of oil over 
but anyway if you're just doing one bike you don't need to go out and buy one of those i do a lot of other work so i've had that for quite some time if you have to buy or buy if you have to grab it with vice grips or some type of channel lock do not do it on the end where the threads are and booger up the threads to where you can't get the nut on them. Scoot down away from the threads if you're using vice grips or what have you and do it down here. That way if it does slip like that and scars up the threads a little bit, it's not on the very end. You can get the nut on and a lot of times as you're tightening the nut, it might get a little bit tighter if you haven't really damaged the threads, but it will clean itself up and work properly. And you're not trying to get a thread on there, a nut on there that is so mangled up it cross threads and then completely strips it and just, you know, ruins your, ruins your chances of getting your bike going right then and just is pain in the ass. Because now you got to pull the stud out, go find some more all thread or a bolt or whatever you have to do to fix that situation. So that's just a friendly little tidbit there. Why I have the paper towels in the engine is it's just forced to have it for me working on things I don't want to take any chances on anything I don't care if it's a pebble a thick ball of dust I don't want it going in the ports of my engine so it's simple enough just take a good old paper towel twist it up and put it in the holes like I said just a friendly little suggestion there another something I do that is why the oil is sitting here I just get any old brand of two cycle oil and I will give a few drops if you have an eyedropper or whatnot. Because if you look in the hole, you see the piston skirt. They put a fine film generally at the factory, but you don't know how long the motor's been sitting in a box waiting for you to purchase it. So the oil may have, if you want to refer to it as evaporated or dried up. Now you got a piston going up and down when you first try to start your bike and or you have to turn the sprocket to get the chain fed through it and then the piston goes up and down and it could scar your cylinder and ruin your chances of your bike firing up when it's time to take it out for its first run. So I take a little two cycle oil and drop some in, just a couple of drops, two or three drops. This actually helps keep the oil in because you can see the blue from my oil that was in there. And it will give a little lubrication. I'm not saying it is a perfect science, but I am saying no oil is not a good thing. And then I'll take a couple drops also, drop it in there. You can see my little oil residue there. This way, after I mount the engine to the bicycle and I have to take the cover off to feed my chain and rotate the sprocket, the piston goes up and down and pretty much self lubricates itself before it ever sees gas and oil. That way I'm pre-lubed. It even helps start it on the first time out there. Gives it a little extra compression because the rings aren't dry, being they have never been worn and they're not seated at all yet anyway. So you get a little extra bonus. Some lubrication, a little extra compression. I use the two cycle oil because that's what it's gonna run on. So it doesn't hurt a thing. If you don't have two cycle oil to waste, or at the moment, any oil will be fine. Three in one oil, 20 W30, you're just using a couple drops. It will burn when the engine starts, so no damage will be caused. And in my personal opinion, some oil is way better than no oil. Now, on some of these bikes, I've done the crane brook in the past. I don't know if you've caught the video, but if you have, yes, I have done these before. But for you at home, sometimes this big hole, which is supposed to house the engine, does not fit. Well, it's supposed to. Let me rephrase that. Where the bottom tube is supposed to sit to mount your engine, a lot of times they do not fit on the frame because they always change the studs don't even go on the frame it's too wide they hit so you have to buy your aftermarket the 
that up there. You have to buy the aftermarket front engine mount that mounts to the fat tube that hooks to your engine. Just one of the little problems is out there of building motorized bikes, that's all. Myself, I've been doing it for years. I'm sure if you've caught my other videos, you've seen them in the past. But I was just going to give a little better description today. A lot of times your kit comes with your plate and your U-bolt. For when this does fit on the frame. And then you mount your plate, put your U-bolt around the, the frame coming up to it. goes through the holes and you tighten the nuts. And it clamps it to the frame. Well, years ago, I was just thinking to myself, when you buy the gas-powered bike actual frame, the aluminum ones that have the gas tank in the top rail of the frame here, all of them come with the welded motor mount to the frame. And I thought, well, just because a person doesn't want to spend $300 on that particular frame and build the bike from, you know, front to rear, why shouldn't they have a good front motor mount just like those bikes? So, I personally just in shop, and I understand everybody can't do it, but if you can, here's how I did it. A lot of times, like I say, some kits cheat you on this plate and you have to make one, but if you get the plate and the kit there that comes with the plate, I use their plate. It is galvanized, so you'll have to grind just the coating of the galvanized off so you get a good weld and I weld just mild steel 3 16 to that and then I will weld this to the lower part of the frame as you can see I'm not that far yet but that's what I'm heading towards the length you'll have to put your bike motor up there and measure because every bike is different they go from three quarter inch I've had them do it to all the way to an inch inch and a quarter depending on the bend of the bottom tube of your frame, which is in here. Lucky for me on this particular bike, I already know the size because I've done like a handful of them. So anyway, that's what I'm going to do. I will measure, position that. Let me get out of whatever light I got there. And then I will set the motor on the frame and see where I need to grind a little paint off of the bicycle frame because I want a good clean surface to weld that to. It doesn't work real well if you leave paint on it. You can weld this with a MIG welder. You do not have to take any of this work. So if you have a MIG welder, that will work just fine. Even the flex core wire, I find that a little more pain, you know, pain in the buttish, if you will. But you can get by with it. I use the gas, just my choice. But a MIG welder will work just fine. You don't have to go for miles and miles to find a guy that can TIG weld because it doesn't really, it's not really necessary for just this little front engine mount. So, it's at this juncture. I'm going to uh, get this motor mocked up in there and see where I have to grind the paint off so I can get that mount welded in there. Before I get to the part of measuring and mounting the front engine mount, I flipped it over and here's the perfect example. I hadn't got to the back ones yet. Right out of the box, this is what I got. If you just go ahead and install that on your bike, don't give it much thought. Could give you problems in the future. Break off a stud or strip it out because it's not in all the way. But just like I said from the factory, you gotta watch their quality and help yourself the best you can by doing these little checks to save you problems in the future. Look how much that thing turns and I don't have a tool on it. That doesn't fit through there. Didn't want to stand up for the demonstration, obviously. But look how much that turns just with my fingers. Still turning. This is why you want to check them. Now she's getting snug. 
It's just that one stud was three turns out, which makes your engine mounting not so secure. As you can see, I have the motor mocked up in my bike. This is just an old cadaver carburetor. But that way I make sure I got plenty of clearance back here. When I position the bike level in the rack, I make sure my carburetor bowls straight as I can possibly get it for each particular bike. This is what I was speaking of, just enough grinding to remove the paint surface so I can get a good weld on it. Check all my clearances. I always run a, get my chain installed not put together but installed that's just hanging there we're not needing that yet but i will take a look down it stretch it tight and make sure that it is 100 percent straight i don't know if you can see that in the video hopefully you can i have my proper clearance here not touching the frame and i also have my tire clearance of at least an eighth to three sixteenths of an inch and that always seems to be adequate all right i am going to put a tack weld here and a tack weld here same thing on the other side and then i will remove the engine and the chain and permanently weld that new motor mount to the frame all right there's a finished product before i apply a little paint i don't want that area to rust after you weld, it takes all the paint and naturally the minerals from the steel immediately. As soon as it gets wet, it rusts, and I don't want that to look nasty later. But man, while I was doing it, they were calling for rain today. So I had to batten down the hatches. Because I don't know if you can see. But we have quite the inclement weather going on. Probably going to add to my pile of sticks. That is some massive wind. So, it looks like we're canceling the test drive when we get it done. So, while it's pouring rain, I'm going to go button up a couple more things and get that bracket painted. And I'll be back shortly. Alrighty then, during the torrential downpour, got a little bit further, got our front engine mount painted so it doesn't rust, that way the bike looks good for a long period of time, don't mind the vice grips if you caught those in the picture, they're holding my clutch actuator lever. So I can spin the wheel and show you because I only have two hands and I'm using one and a half of them. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway, so far so good. Our chain is 100% lined up. Got clearance of the tire, clearance on our frame. We're not touching anything we're not supposed to be touching it's straight and true that is why i am a big fan of the aluminum hub mount i get some people that disagree but i am a personal fan of it if you have to use the rag joint it will work adequately but the things I don't like about them is sometimes you get uneven rubbers that come with it for the mounting. And then your sprocket wobbles or it does the, the egg turn, which I like to refer to it. Instead of turning completely around, it rolls like that. Then you got tight chain, loose chain, tight chain, loose chain. And if uh, you've installed one and you have that, that's what's doing it for you. So you'll understand for those who have, you understand. For those who are going to try it and find out, you will understand. I personally get these hub mounts, which work 100%, never slip. 
from a gentleman off eBay. I do believe it is TKO Moto. He has them for the one inch freewheel and the inch and a half coaster brake. I really prefer them on the coaster brake bikes like this. If you can see the gap in it, that means it is completely tight, or I'm saying when it's completely tight, you should have a little gap in it. That means it is squeezing and doing all the torque and all of the pressure on the hub where it should be. Although it does touch the spoke, it is not pulling on the spoke. I have never since using these for years now, have I ever had a bike problem, rear wheel, spoke damage, chains coming off because of untrue sprocket, turning all wobbly. They are worth the money, 100%. I've seen videos and I've talked to people and you've, if anybody's done any homework on them, you've seen the people with the uh, hub mount that slips and either damages the spokes or they're trying to cut a keyway in it or trying to glue it to it or whatever method they're trying to do. It doesn't work. Buy the correct part. Don't have the problems. Okay, enough speech about that. That's just my... Personal always will not build a bike without putting one on it. Motto. Our chain tensioner. When you run the sprocket or the uh, hub mount, it's more of a just a chain guide to refeed my chain back here. I shorten the chain, cut the chain, shorten the chain, however you want to refer to it, with a chain breaker because they do send you a long chain. So it's best to shorten it up as short as you can possibly get it with it having a little play so it has a little room for adjustment because it's going to stretch and limber up a little bit after a few rides. So it's nice to have a little adjustment. I also heavy gauge steel rivet myself through the frame. I haven't ever seen it happen since the inception of using the hub mount. But if you're using the rag joint, a pro another problem folks have with that is the chain gets a little slop or they can't get the rear sprocket straight to where it's not doing the egg thing or it's wobbling as you turn the wheel. You'll watch it and it'll burr, 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 burr. Well, when you're out riding fast and the chain gets a little slop in it, super, super slack, you do want a little slack. You don't want this super tight, putting a bunch of tension on your bearings back here in the wheel. But having said that, guys that have super duper slop, the chain will get to bouncing as you go down the road, ride up on the teeth, and could yank this into your spokes. And that is a tragic moment waiting to happen. Because that's what usually does it. For those who don't tighten this correctly and or drill and pin it some way, shape, or form. I've seen guys use a tiny screw and bolt. Well, bolt, not a screw. But drill all the way through and put a nut, screw, bolt. They keep saying screw. Put a bolt through it. That way, whatever happens, if that, God forbid, that should ever happen, it will not allow your chain tensioner to get yanked into your spokes. Because that could cause a catastrophic accident for you, the rider. So, other than that, Got to button a few more things up, and uh, this bad fella should be ready to go out and test ride here right shortly. Before I proceed any further with the video of the buttoning up and the gas tank and the finishing up of this bike, I want to share a little thought or my personal comment of what I would like to refer to as the fender, please. Yes. The motorized bicycle fender, please. Who always seem to find an occasional video of mine and remind me or tell me or inform me of how I'm going to die or someone else is going to die due to fenders just immediately falling off, wedging in your wheel, locking up the bike while you're riding. I am not in any way, shape, or form saying that is not a possibility in your life. 
I ask every customer if they would like the fenders removed and I give them the story that it could happen. This particular customer wants the fenders on there because where he lives, he says it rains quite a bit and he would appreciate the fenders on there so he doesn't get the old stripe up the back. This gentleman is not going to go out trail riding and abusing the bike. I know personally that is just this pers this case in point on this particular bike. But anyway, I do agree that fenders are not built like they used to. If you are old enough and remember the 70s and 80s bicycles, the fenders were so heavily built, you could almost sit on them and they would never ding, dent, or crack. These fenders on today's bikes are a lot thinner. And I understand that. I give everybody the option to have them or not have them. That is your personal safety decision, I would guess, to say. But I will admit, after being around steel my whole life, unless it is a heavy, being torqued piece of steel, say like a tractor bucket picking up 10 tons, and if something, God forbid, should break an arm on a tractor under a heavy duress hydraulic load to where it immediately snaps off like a bone fenders are a little different I can almost guarantee that anybody who's had fender problems they didn't just all of a sudden you're riding down the road and the bike fender is all perfect like this and then all of a sudden the next thing you know all three pivot all three mounting points there there and the one on this side and the one on that side completely just snapped out of the blue and jammed in your wheel and caused an accident. At one point in time, the fender started rattling. Either a rivet came loose from the factory where they mount the bracket inside the fender to hook to your bike, front or rear, doesn't matter. Something came loose first and was making noise or a rattle. And probably, if I was a betting man, the person just kept riding. Never stopped, never checked, didn't make any attempt to fix it or correct the problem or go somewhere and have someone look at it to correct the problem. Just kept on going. It finally did break off the rest of the way. That is when it fell into the tire and either jammed in the front wheel or jammed in the back wheel and created an accidental moment for that individual. I wasn't there for any of them, but I'm pretty much assuming that's how that went down. So, for the fender, please. Yes, I'm aware of the dangers of having a fender riding fast on a motorized bike. On the other hand, I leave that up to the customer after completely informing them of what could happen. I have fenders on my bikes. I've had those bikes, well, the one bike I've had for two, well, a year now, I just got it, the four stroke going this year. So I can't really say, got a whole, you know, mass of years on that one. But my orange two cycle bike, I have had fenders on that for eight, nine years, same fenders, never had a moment's worth of problem. I don't have to keep an eye on them. Every once in a while, I'll give them a little shake, make sure nothing's loose. If I hear something rattling, I will stop and take a look at it and or bring it over here to the shop and uh, repair it or replace it. I don't want to have an accident either. I don't want anybody else to have an accident. It is a good idea to take them off and that removes any chance you may have of an accident. But if you have them on there and you take care of them, you should be just fine. This decision is entirely up to you. Now that you've had to sit through my personal synopsis slash tidbit rant, I guess, about fenders, this bad fella is finished and ready to go out for the old street test ride. See if she runs. Hopefully all of the pre-tightening of the bolts and all the nuts and the retorquing of things all comes together right now. 
I always do the motor tightening bolts, like I said, because the factory sometimes doesn't do its job 100%. And if you don't catch that stuff, sometimes that is the reason for the old air leak on the two cycle engines. If the case has a little air leak to it, that's what usually makes them rev up out of control or have a uncontrollable, I don't know, rev, if you will, when you're trying to ride the thing. I have had people call me and send me messages and I suggest tightening those up and a lot of people that have the old high rev thing going on discover that or didn't know about that step or what they do discover that some of the case bolts were loose here and there every once in a great moon and uh, yep it quits doing that high rev stuff even the intakes every once in a while you need a little snugging well from new out of the box. But anyway, that's for a whole different complete video. Take a quick walk around this dude. Got the chain guard installed. Everything's adjusted, ready to roll. Tires are aired up. Bearings are greased. Wheels are tight, handlebars are tight, etc., etc. I always suggest if you don't build the bike from scratch out of a box, to check every nut and bolt the bike has if you bought it from the box store. Because a lot of times in the back, they're not doing a lot of quality work and you put a motor on it, now you're gonna go out and magnify that problem. You don't wanna find out those handlebars aren't tightened correctly when you're cracking down the road with the motor running. So it's best to do all that now. So enough of my bottom jaw flapping. Let's unrack this bad fella and uh, run it up a pole, see who salutes. What can I say? Another success story. Fired right up within a couple bike lengths and then one time or two. Ready to do a little adjustment on the idle. But other than that, should be ready to roll. There we have it. Your brand new 22 ADCC 26 inch Cranbrook ready to roll. All right, well, I hope at least a couple of the tips with the stud tool, if one has one or one wants to get one, to not damage their stud threads when they're tightening them. I hope that little advice helps after my first ride with this one and i suggest everyone take a look at it after your very first initial startup ride around wherever it is you ride i always bring it back in and readjust my clutch cable which i'll roll over here because even brand new out of the box it immediately stretches a little bit after a few five or six pulls even. Sometimes I put a little tension on them and just apply the clutch and let it hold it for a little bit. I use a piece of wire or something or set the lever and then I'll reset it because it does stretch from brand new. After my first tank full of fuel, I will suggest you give the old chain a look, make sure it doesn't need any adjustment. And does it get any extra slack? Being those chains from brand new will stretch a little bit and relax. All right, as always, I hope any part of this video entertained you or helped you with a problem you may be having with your bike. Maybe you're building the same bike. Hopefully one of these little suggestions help you out. All right, until next time, I got other stuff to do.